Good morning. My name is Dominique Brzezinski, and I work at Apple in information security. I've spent most of the last 20 years building intrusion detection and incident response tools and systems, uh, largely for FANG companies. So now at Apple, this is actually kind of V2 for me. And so I really want to talk about what it takes to do threat detection and response at scale. So this talk is really about the data platform that's necessary versus the specific security analytics. Those are a bit sensitive. Uh, but it turns out, just like a lot of other areas, that with security, you have to break the data silos and you have to invest in building a platform up front that can do a broad set of workloads at very high volume. Uh, and if you don't focus on that and you focus on more narrow use cases, you're probably likely to fail and kind of paint yourself in a corner. So we're gonna go over some use cases, uh, give some sense of scale, and then kind of look at the challenges and solutions that we built. Uh, but this is what we're really driving towards. And it's a little screencast of a proof of concept that we built on Databricks with SQL and graph frames uh, using the Keylines visualization library. And if we could uh, play the screencast, that would be awesome. So what this really is, is not only do we wanna detect attacks, but we actually want to be able to contextualize the whole thing. We want to go from what signal we detected and be able to figure out what the root cause is, as well as what actually happened and how we need to contain and what the scope of the incident might be. Um, and so this is a great little graph that actually has time encoded into it and you can watch the progression. So hold on. There we go. You can see it really quick. And uh, in this case, it was actually one of our pen test teams, and we detected them. And they found a command injection. We were able to create a reverse shell. And they were able to uh, steal some secrets from a service. So hold on. We got clicker delay. OK, uh, so what does it take to enable detection and analytics? So we actually have to deal with a super diverse set of threats. Uh, that require a diverse set of data. And what can happen is signal can show up and it can be strong or weak, it can be in one data set, it can be spread across many, and it can be close in time, or it could be as far as months apart in time. And so this is a big challenge. So we get pretty far with kind of a simple pattern, which is take some data stream, left join it with context, and then filter or inner join it with something like indicators of compromise, which a certain facets of an event. And these are things that you can kind of detect in like a single event or a couple events joined together with context. You can do a lot with this, but you can't do everything. So the other far end is we need to be able to take a long time window of multiple data sets and be able to correlate those. And it turns out graphs are to security like peanut butter is to jelly. But graphs at scale are super hard and take a lot of machinery to do. So the other side of this is after we detect, we actually have to triage that detection, and we have to do containment if it's a true positive. And this is really comes down to search and query, whether it's ad hoc by people uh, or whether it's part of an automated workflow. And uh, casually, I separate search and query as search is looking for particular events by some attribute of the event, and query is things like relations and aggregations. But it turns out that our users like to do both of these things over really long time windows. And at our scale, that can be a lot of data. So our ETL system does, on average, about 3.5 million events a second. It's over 100 terabytes. Hold on, clicker delay. Over 100 terabytes of new data a day, over 300 billion events a day. So our most queried table, yeah, it's a half petabyte and growing fast, 11 trillion rows. And uh, this is one of the first places that people go to answer questions, look for things, or validate that a detection might be real. So how do we get there, and how do we satisfy this broad set of use cases? So we built an ingestion architecture uh, that really tries to solve a lot of these problems and balance issues. And we have all our data come to us uh, into S3 in a kind of consistent JSON wrapper. And we have a single ETL job that takes all the new data and writes it into a delta staging table. And so the staging table is a single table. It's partitioned by date and event type. 
and it has a very long retention. And it's really optimized to stream new data into and then stream data out of. But you can actually go and query it using standard SQL functions. So then what we do is the data that we're really concerned with and is of highest value, we write parsers for, and we have discrete parsing streams that take that data, put it into a common schema, and then write it out into another delta table. So we have a set of delta tables that are all individual data sets that are well parsed, well structured, and we actually use optimization from delta with Z ordering in order to uh, basically get index over the primary columns that are common predicates, right? So if we've got to search by IP addresses or domain names, <coughs> excuse me, and those are in the sets, then, right, those are the things that we actually order it by and take advantage of data skipping. So sometimes we mess up parsers, and that actually can be a super big operational pain in a lot of architectures. And uh, we quickly found that this single staging table model uh, was really great because all we do is correct the parser code, and then we just restart the stream from the beginning of the staging table or from whatever date partition where we introduce the bug, and then we just let it run forward, and after a little bit of time, we have all the data corrected in the retention window, and then we're back processing it real time correcting parse and we have data that's good. So we don't have to repackage code as a batch job to backfill and correct nothing. We literally just fix code, rerun it in the same model, and we're away we go. So then off of these refined tables or parse data sets, uh, this is where the detection comes in. We have a number of detection streams and batches that run against these tables, do the logic and the analysis, whether it's facet-based, whether it's statistical, right, doesn't really matter. And the alerts that come out of it all go to their own alert table. And this, again, is Delta. It's long retention, and it has a consistent schema to it. And from that, there's another streaming job dangling off of that that applies deduplication, whitelisting, and ultimately it writes the alerts out to our alert orchestration and management system. And the great thing about this is we durably store all the alerts, whether or not they were deduped or they were whitelisted. And this allows us to go back, make sure that they're good, revise them, fix them, make sure our dedupe logic looks good. If we mess up and whitelist something accidentally, we can go back and query that table and see if there were any events generated in the time where we accidentally whitelisted. And if there are, we can drive those through the alert process. So this gives us a lot of operational sanity. It also gives us a nice feedback loop. The other great thing about this architecture is any analyst or engineer working in threat response can go make queries or go build code in a notebook and to turn it into an actual detection job is just scheduling that notebook and writing the output through our alert library, which really just remodels the data and writes it into the alert table. That's it, super easy. Code review, run in test mode for a little while, make sure that the true positive, false positive rate looks good, that we understand it, refine it if need be, flip it to production. So where this gets super interesting is, like I said, that most commonly queried table is a half petabyte. So if we normally had to go through and look at something like, I gotta find all the traffic between one IP and another, traditionally in like Spark SQL, this would be a full table scan. Right? That'd be 500 terabytes of data. That thing is going to complete in days or not complete at all. But since we use the Z ordering optimize on things like IP columns, we actually can take a query like this and it goes from 500 terabytes, thanks to data skipping, down to like 36 terabytes. That actually will complete within a shift if need be, and this is worst case. Average case is searching over weeks or months. And in that case, it turns tens of minutes of queries into minutes and sometimes even tens of seconds. And that's amazing. That makes it actually usable for ad hoc analysis and refinement, speeds up dev time because you can actually do the work and rerun it practically. So huge improvement, big win to search 7% of the data instead of 100% of the data. What we ended up with is a truly simple and unified platform that allows a team to focus their expertise 
on really a small set of concepts and kind of a simple topology, and they can just remodel the topology as needed. We can create new tables of intermediate or aggregate data, and we can then just dangle streams off of those or join against them. And this creates a really great pattern for us to actually solve a huge diverse set of those workloads from low latency streaming all the way to really long time window query and analysis. So Michael's gonna come out and uh, do a demo of Delta and really kind of kick the tires and show you some of the advantages of it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dom. What do you guys think of that use case? It's pretty cool. I'm excited not only about the scale of that use case, but also how important it is to Apple. And it's actually also kind of personally special to me because it was here at this conference in Moscone Center one year ago where I met Dom and we started working on this together. I'd love to tell you that whole story, but unfortunately, I have my own security problem I need to deal with. My friend just called me while I was backstage. Uh, let's just call him Tim Book. Uh, and he, we're going we're gonna to have to dive in because he's got a problem. So there's malware spreading throughout his network. And we need to hunt and find the machines that are infected so we can quarantine them and fix the problem. So fortunately, we've got a bunch of logs and traces and JSON and CSV data using another Berkeley open source project called Bro that collects every network connection that's going on. And I'm going to try to hunt it using Spark. Someone else on my team has already put it into a data lake. So let's go and try and find if there's any suspicious connections. So I'll just do select star from, and it, they encode it in Parquet. We'll pull it out of the data lake. And we're going to look where the destination port equals 666. Very suspicious. So it's going to go and it's going to do the standard thing. It's going to list all of the partitions. We've got data going all the way back to 2014. And, oh, OK, that's not great. Um, well, we'll cancel this. So you're probably saying, OK, you can't store years and years worth of data just in a blob store. You need to use a meta store. So fortunately, I've already put this data into the Hive meta store as well. So let's try that. We'll just do Hive connections. OK, great. And it looks like they've already partitioned it by IP address because, uh, you know, that's a, a good thing to search on. And, OK, well, whoever set this up seemed to forget that there are billions of possible IP addresses. Not a good idea. Uh, so that's OK. Um, so what's wrong here? Why, why are these kinds of data problems so hard? Well, it turns out every data problem is actually two different problems. You have data engineering which is bringing in the raw data, cleaning it, partitioning it, streaming it, and then dealing with all of the performance problems that come with setting up that architecture in a naive way, like small problems and badly ordered data. And then there's this other problem of data science where you actually want to extract insights from that data. However, when you're operating at this scale, what I've seen over and over again is organizations struggle to even get past step one. So instead, let's try it with Delta. So fortunately, Delta is just using standard Spark APIs for streaming and batch. So I can just do create table uh, connections using Delta. And we'll just load in that raw JSON data I was talking about before. So select star from JSON, and we'll pull out data slash connections. So we'll kick off this Spark job. And what it's actually going to do in the background is it's going to go and scan all of that JSON data look at each of the individual records, figure out the schema for each record, and then run a distributed Spark job that actually comes up with a grand unified schema for all of that JSON data. It's going to take it and parse it and put it into a more efficient format, insert it into the Delta table, and transactionally commit it. And so now I can do sele uh, select star from connections where destination port equals 666. OK, so now it's actually going out. It's running first a Spark job to identify the data, and then another Spark job to actually query the relevant files. And as you can see, we found a bunch of stuff here. And so, OK, that's great. But Michael, you're saying uh, the problem here is we just did a batch job, and this is a security use case. 
So I need up to the minute information. A batch job's not going to cut it because they might still be infecting my network as we speak. Fortunately, Delta plugs into both the streaming and batch APIs of Apache Spark. So I can just do insert into connections, select star from Kafka stream, and that will kick off a streaming job in the background that will give me low latency data, which is great. So now I'm going to have up to the MNA information for the hunt. Now, here normally I would have to go back to this data engineering problem because the streaming job is great for low latency, but it's not so good for throughput because now I've got a bunch of tiny files. But with Delta, we actually don't need to do that anymore because we have this thing called Optimize. Optimize can give you both low latency ingestion and high throughput reads by coming back after the fact and collapsing those files using snapshot isolation. We can even do this trick where we can take multiple dimensions of data that you're interested in querying on, for example, source IP address and destination IP address. We can map that into this thing called a space filling curve and arrange the data in a way where we can search on both dimensions efficiently. So I'm actually just going to skip over all of the rest of the data engineering and go directly to data science. So I'm going to switch to my favorite language here, Python, and we'll do netviz and do a SQL query. And we'll just pull this SQL query here so we can visualize the spread of this through the network. So we'll just paste that right there and hit enter. And it ran really quickly because of caching. And we could see patient zero as the virus spreads throughout the network. Pretty cool, right? So to summarize, the idea of Delta here is we can actually unify the problems of data engineering and data science by giving you reliability and fast analytics in a single platform. Thank you very much.